To borrow a line from my guest today on the Over the Horizon podcast, space is hard, space is expensive, and space is high risk. That's a lot in one sentence, but it puts in perspective where we are as a species, where we're trying to get, and the difficulties that lie ahead. I take great pleasure today in uh, introducing to you Dr. Shona Pandya. She's a physician, aquanaut, explorer. She is the director of the Space Medicine Group at the International Institute of Aeronautical Sciences, where she's a space medicine and austere environments researcher. She wears many hats. She says she lives out of a suitcase. She's always on the move. And if you follow on LinkedIn, she has one of the most um, astonishingly uh, hectic and glamorous uh, lifestyles that uh, any aquanaut and uh, physician can have. Dr. Pandya, thank you for your time and welcome to the OTH podcast. Well, thank you so much for having you, having me. It's my pleasure to be here. All right. So let me just uh, pull up uh, your profile so that uh, my audience can uh, get to know you a bit better. And uh, if you can talk us through. Um, so this is, of course, your LinkedIn profile. And uh, please do not spam Dr. Pandya. Um, <laughs> but that's uh, if you want to reach out to her on LinkedIn, uh, you can. Uh, another very interesting hat she uh, she wears is at the IIAS, and I believe that's you in uh, the, the photograph there. Yeah, that was. Uh, there's a really cool story to that photo. Uh, I would love to talk about it this hour. Yeah. So, um, as you said, I am the director of the International Institute for Astronautical Sciences Space Medicine Group. I teach their space medicine course. I've been involved with the organization for. Uh, close to a decade now, and um, we are all um, all about um, advancing citizen science as it pertains to bioastronautics, to atmospheric science, and more. And um, one of the moonshot goals we had as an institution was to enable citizen scientist astronauts. And that photo that you see there is our first ever research flight on a suborbital vehicle, uh, making our flyer a suborbital researcher or astronaut. So you can see I was part of the payload team that supported the science. This took place with Unity um, on Virgin's Galactic 5 mission um, last month. So this was a really recent photo. Um, so you can see um, myself second from the left there. Um, and right beside me in the middle there is Kelly Girardi, who flew the space and um, just knocked it out of the park with our science. So it's, uh, you know, it's an amazing memory. Um, the co-PIs, Aaron Prasad, Yvette Gonzalez, are just amazing to work with. Um, so it's a lot of happy memories there. I borrowed a line from one of your posts on LinkedIn where you said space is hard, space is expensive and high risk. We aren't built to be in space. We haven't evolved as homo sapiens to, to build in space. We've evolved here on planet Earth. And yet we aspire to be homo galacticus. We aspire to go to space and be a space-faring uh, race. But I think we do sometimes need a reality check. So help us with that reality check. Yeah, so, so thank you for that question. I think you left out the last and most important part of that. Space is hard, space is expensive, and space is trying to kill you. Um, so I often say that. Um, so people ask me, a lot of my research is in space medicine. It's one of my passions. It's what I try to enable at the um, IIAS. Um, and so what exactly does that mean? Why does space medicine exist as a field? Well, first of all, when we consider the challenges of the spaceflight environment, um, you know, we break them down into the big five. We talk about radiation, isolation and confinement, distance from Earth, um, the big one that we all think about when we talk about space, which is altered gravity environments, whether we're talking about the increased uh, G loads of launch and landing, whether we're talking about microgravity on the International Space Station, um, or whether we're talking about altered gravity on the moon and Mars, and then everything else which falls under um, the last category, which is hostile environments. So that includes altered day night cycles. So up on the International Space Station, um, astronauts will experience 16 sunrise sunset cycles per 24 hour period. So that's one sunset sunrise cycle every 90 minutes. Um, and then on the moon, if you're at the lunar equator, um, your day night cycle is 
14 days of day and 14 days of night. So you can imagine it's a little bit hard to sleep in that environment, um, as well as being scheduled down to the five minute mark. Um, we talk about lunar dust. We haven't yet talked about um, the challenges of being isolated and confined for so long. So this is why space medicine is a field because there's so much to, to consider to mitigate, but also to optimize. So we keep these highly functioning individuals performing at their peak and not disrupted by the environment or their, their adaptation to the environment. You're right. In, um, and we've seen so many cases of astronauts when they come back to Earth from the International Space Station, having spent three months, four, five, I think the longest stint was nine months. I think uh, Commander Rubio just broke the record um, for most days in Correct. space. I think he, yeah, I think uh, he might be close to a year. Oh, so yeah, um, that, we're always pushing yeah. the boundaries. Yeah, that is wow. That is something. Um, it's it's so a lot of these astronauts, men and women, come back and face different sorts of difficulties. There's muscle atrophy. Um, there's bone density loss. Um, there's the the psychological aspect, uh, as you touched upon. Um, what have we learned from from, I guess this zero to one stage where we go to microgravity from, from sea level. Yeah, it's really interesting because we have the luxury of 4.7 billion years of uh, evolution, which shows us that, you know, we all do pretty well in 1G. That's true for humans. It's true for giraffes. It's true for amoebas. Um, and then when we get to the microgravity environment, um, the adaptations are totally different. So as you correctly alluded to, our bones lose density without countermeasures, our muscles lose mass, our fluids shift upwards, meaning that our faces become puffy. Um, we experience um, a congestion as if we've had a cold. Um, we, we feel like uh, food is less flavorful and that fluid shift also has consequences for um, our brains because the fluid within our central nervous systems, that cerebrospinal fluid, which bathes our brains and our spines, it shifts upwards, creating these pockets of increased um, pressure um, around the backs of our eyes, around our optic nerves, which can create uh, pressure or swelling around the optic nerve, which can in fact result in vision shifts or hyperopia. So, um, you know, knowing these, these um, Adaptations to the microgravity environment are really critical just because um, it helps us know if without countermeasures, without optimization, um, what might happen um, and how we need to mitigate. For example, with bone density and muscle mass loss, what we do is um, astronauts are um, very well looked after by their rehab team, by their physicians. They take part in pre-flight prehab, uh, so rehabilitation schedules that are very tailored to their um, uh, to their to the individual and then on station astronauts famously have to work out for one to two hours a day um, up to six days a week um, performing aerobic and resistive exercise to resistance help mitigate. exercise yeah I would exactly imagine. that's yeah. exactly it to help mitigate that um, that bone muscle and bone density loss and muscle mass loss yeah so if I mean since you uh, your specialty is space medicine. If you can give us some insight into how you go about designing exercise regimes for for astronauts, because <laughs> I mean, it's it's. I mean, I I would imagine um, back here on Earth. I mean, you're you're fighting gravity when you lift objects, or when you do isometric exercises, and you're you're using your own body weight um, to strengthen your 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 joints, your ligaments, your tendons, your muscles, and you build core. Um, but up in space and microgravity, how do you even begin to kind of and design these exercise regimes? And is it has is there enough evidence to show us so far that it is sufficient? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, taking your your answer with the last question. Um, so without countermeasures, um, researchers have found that bone density loss occurs at a rate of one point five percent per month. So without any countermeasures, um, we're pretty much dooming our astronauts to um, to osteoporosis or a, a condition where bone density is lost to the point where bones are very brittle, fragile. There's increased risk of breaking bones or having a fracture. Um, so um, when physi when physiologists and exercise um, and rehab specialists are designed for astronauts, um, they're also designing for the zero G environment. So it's not as simple as getting on a treadmill as it is on Earth, because um, if you're not strapped down to the zero to the treadmill in zero G, 
you're not doing anything. You're essentially on a trampoline. Um, so famously on the International Space Station, the treadmill is called the Colbert. It's named after Stephen Colbert. It's called the Combined Load-Bearing Ergonomic Resistance Trainer, which is a backronym. Um, and there's a very fun story to that. Um, so back when they were naming the newest US module to the International Space Station, Stephen Colbert, who's a notorious space fan, um, got his fans to overwhelmingly vote in favor of naming the station after him. And NASA said, well, we probably can't do that and we probably shouldn't do that, but we do appreciate the outreach and the support for space. So um, they yeah. named their second treadmill um, after him. And so the yeah. way astronauts run on that is actually if you see them, they're actually um, tethered down to the treadmill so they can still engage in aerobic exercise. They're not going flying off to the other end of the space station. And in fact, astronaut Sunita Williams famously ran the Boston Marathon over four hours up in space, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then to the second part of your question, well, how do we lift weights if there's no gravity? You you know, I could easily say I bench press 600 and, um, you know, in zero gravity, what does that mean? Um, so it, there's no point in bringing up dumbbells and weights to the space station because it's ineffective and also that costs a lot of money to... Um, bring um to to launch things to space so in fact what um the exercise trainer that um allows for weightlifting for squats for lifts on station it's called the advanced resistive exercise device or the arids device so it uses hydraulics to induce that's exactly it right there in that photo it uses hydraulics to induce a state of um uh, uh resistance so as to be able to emulate um, performing weight exercises. Let's um, talk about science and space. And the ISS is essentially a space lab. It's coming to the end of its its life. There's a lot of um, a lot of talk and debate about what to do with the ISS, whether to deorbit it, um, whether to just take it to one of the Lagrange points and just let it hang out there. You know, as a testament to our our spirit of uh, endeavor and um, our, just the achievement of the collective human race. There have been so many different um, science experiments uh, that are, that continue to take place on the ISS. Um, and I just want to pull this up. Yeah, yeah. 3D, 3D printed printing. hearts on the ISS. Tell us more because this is really exciting and this could unlock secrets um, and help us take us further into deep space. Yeah, you know, the beauty of exploration, especially in this age, is we're taking novel concepts with new technologies, with bold new ideas. And so organ printing is one of them. Um, and, you know, we often hear the argument, well, why are we spending all of this money on space exploration when we have all of these problems on Earth? And this right here is a prime example of bringing um, that benefit back to humanity. So the other win recently um, was successfully printing neem in a sky, 3D printing neem in a sky um, on station. So again, if you have arthri arthritis, wear and tear in your knee, um, we can 3D print neem in a sky for that. And so um, when we look at the, the novelty um, and the unique aspects of working in space, a lot of that comes from the microgravity environment. And so there are a number of success stories out there. Um, so Lambda Vision is a company out of the US that is working to print retinal uh, proteins layer by layer, which they can do in the microgravity environment, but they not, can't necessarily do on Earth there very easily. And they're right. using it to address um, conditions like retino retinitis pigmentosa or macular degeneration, which affect um, you know numerous on Earth. And so being able to solve our um, greatest challenges on Earth with our unique problems, um, with uh, with our unique solutions that are born from space, you know, is a huge win. Another example, there's so many examples. Um, I often like to point out the example of the Rodent Research 19 experiment, which came back from ISS in about September 2020. And basically, um, this is a win for genetic engineering because they took these uh, genetically enhanced little mice. And so they're, they're very cute because they look right. really muscular um, compared to the wild type counter parts and basically they had a neuromuscular blockade as a mutation which um, prevented um, muscle mass and bone density loss which as we know are you know to be expected within the space flight environment um, and they found compared to the mice who did not have that mutation there was less muscle mass loss and less bone density loss um, 
and in some cases, in, in fact, even increased muscle mass. So um, that has implications for astronauts on long duration space flight. And it also has implications um, for neurodegenerative and neuromuscular diseases on Earth, like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, um, which um, my cousin, in fact, um, uh, passed from. So, you know what, it, this, this research, it really has this um, incredible potential um, you know, when we're talking about emerging technologies and emerging concepts, we also talk about, you know, using the microgravity environment as the next great manufacturing facility and um, leveraging Indeed. the microgravity environment for pharmaceuticals to build um, crystals, um, drug crystals, protein crystals, um, protein formations that are um, bigger, that are more symmetrical. Um, we talk about using it for semiconductors. Um, for fiber optic cables, um, for novel materials engineering uses. So really, this is this is the other argument for why it's critical to increase and facilitate access to the spaceflight environment. Um, because once we unlock a novel platform and use our uh, creativity and our imaginations to solve hard problems, we can address a lot of key issues for long duration spaceflight and also solve for Earth at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm just trying to cue this up to the point where uh, it shows, there you go, beating Beautiful. hot cells. That's, you know, that's, it gives me chills to think about because every time there's a one win, we also have scientists saying, how can we extend that research? What can we build off of that? What can we do next? Um, and, you know, you shone that, that, you showed that plant in the red light. So there's a lot of good research around aquaponics. Um, uh, on station and growing plants in situ, and they've even grown lettuce and eaten it on station. Um, and then there's uh, Trish, the Translational Research Institute for Space Health based out of the US and affiliated with Baylor College of Medicine. And basically they bet on big ideas um, to solve for space health and for health on earth. And they've in fact even engineered pharmaceuticals into lettuce. So they've uh, engineered medication into lettuce. So when you're eating your salad, you're also getting your medication as well. Um, you know, I've had, I had, I've had friends who said, well, you know, talk to me when it's chocolate, uh, which is a fair criticism. Uh, but I think still think it's pretty amazing to be able to um, is synthetically, uh, genetically engineer and enhance our lettuce to the point of be, being dual use. Yeah, I mean, how cool would it be if your if your organ came from space or if your food <laughs> came from space? I, mean, if you, I would be if okay you want, with that. <laughs> I would be really down with that. Yes, um, but just explain to us why is it that you can do these things in microgravity and not on Earth, especially when it comes to printing tissue, 3D printing tissue, um, blood vessels and different sorts of tissue um, in microgravity and why you can't do the same things on Earth. Yeah, so one of the key advantages is there's no downward force vector. And so, for example, um, in my final years of medical school, I authored a review on tissue, tissue engineering and microgravity. And when, when we have cells in the 1G environment, there's that downward force vector, which in certain cases is critical for development, for cells to know which way is up and which way is down. But when the forces are equal in all um, different, um, in all planes, in all axes, then it allows us to um, to escape that downward 1G force and grow um, cells that might be able to uh, grow in a different in a different scaffold in a different uh, architecture. And so, um, definitely, you know, in my own research, we've seen that with uh, we've we've researched that application for foam um, in space. And so, the to use an analogy, when we see foam what made on Earth, it's still subjected to that 1G environment. So, if you look at the distribution of the foam bubbles, um, it won't right. be even. You know, it'll yeah. be it'll depend where on the foam it is closer to the bottom. Versus, we've seen. Um, even uh, research from the European Space Agency that shows that liquid foam, the bubbles distribute more evenly because of that lack of gravity and they're bigger. So that fundamentally alters the properties of that substance. So that's why uh, microgravity is such a valuable environment and laboratory for, for science and for engineering and for medicine. So, okay, let me ask you this. How close are we to actually build, um, bioprinting or 3D printing um, viable, let's say a viable heart or a, or a liver in space and then transplanting it into a human on Earth? 
I think, well, I think the, the answer is always the same old uh, one-liner and that further studies are needed. So um, a, 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 a proof of concept and a proof of technology is always extraordinarily promising. It's a big win. Um, but we always, you know, when we talk about how we get something approved to the point of being a medically approved therapy, you know, we have to first make sure it does no harm, um, that it, uh, so it does no harm. It says, Good, at least as good as the gold standard. And then it, across multiple trials, across multiple centers, across multiple populations, large scale, double blinded, multi center trials that are randomized, um, we have to make sure that they also offer some benefit. Um, so, you know, it's it, it, whether you're talking about innovation in Earth, innovation in space, the standards don't change because the safety is critical. Um, and it comes back to the first principle of medicine, do no harm. It's interesting that um, the CRISPR treatment for, I think it was sickle cell has just got the FDA clearance. I uh, saw that, yeah. Yeah, so it just, uh, it's just, these are, these are exciting times we're living in. You never know uh, what's around the corner. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's really interesting, even within my lifetime, watching diseases that were once, um, you know, fatal, that were once a death sentence become chronic diseases. So um, AIDS, HIV is now a chronic mm -hmm. disease. Um, it's not a death sentence. Um, yeah. Melanoma, which was once one of the scariest types of malignancies or cancers um, through immunomodulation therapy, um, is now uh, has a much higher survival rate. So these are this living in this time in this this age of innovation um, and doing so for good. It's one of the most exciting times from a biomedical standpoint. Sometime back, we sent up these little water bears, these chubby little water bears <laughs> uh, to the ISS, uh, tardigrades. Why did we do that? And what did we, what are tardigrades to begin with? Yeah, there are these minuscule little life, um, life forms. They're everywhere. Um, they're indestructible pretty much, you know, you put them in va a vacuum, you put them in the coldest environments, you can revive them after um, inordinate periods of time. So, you know, they kind of do hold the key to life there because they're just so resilient uh, in really harsh environments. And, you know, plus the, the, the moniker water bearer is a little bit cuter. <laughs> uh, so I think people have fallen in love with this resilient little species and they offer so many insights when it comes to um, uh, longevity and hibernation and um, lifespan and hardiness in, in harsh environments. And if so, is the thinking that if, if these guys can survive and adapt and therefore survive to high levels of radiation and extreme temperature changes, et cetera, and zero or microgravity, not zero gravity, but microgravity, then there are learnings and takeaways for us as humans that we can apply. Yeah, there there are a few steps there. And it's sort of um it's 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 a little bit of looking at them and saying, well, we they can. Um it's not it's not thinking if they can, then we can. It's if they can, then why can't we? And what secrets do we need to in, unlock within our own right. um, metabolism and our genomics and our proteomes and our uh, metabolomics um, that would lead us there? And so, um, you know, is it genetic enhancement? Is it um, is it uh, looking at synergies between how our metabolism interacts with our genetics? Um, is it you know is it a physiological process? Uh, is it a synergy between all of those things? And so um, it's it's important because when we talk about long duration space flight, um, some of the showstoppers include the amount of radiation that we're exposed to uh, beyond the Van Allen belts when it comes to deep space. Um, and so knowing how little little organisms like the tardigrade or the water bear can um, survive in such harsh environments can help us potentially unlock secrets into um, making ourselves more resilient um, in the face of these harsh environments. And there's this great article from the MIT review um, in about 20, from about 2016, and they talk about genetically enhancing humans so that they're more resilient to the high radiation environment of space. And they argue that there's an ethical imperative to do so because we're sending these astronauts to a very high risk, high radiation environment. Um, so yeah. understanding how we, we know that certain organisms have a better survival um, uh, capacity in these harsh environments. So it starts with studying their survivability. 
Um, one other really cool example is looking at human hibernation. And right now it's the stuff of science fiction, um, but the European Space Agency has done some um, work on it, some computer modeling on it. Um, there's uh, biology institutes, I think it's the Alaska Biology Institute that is looking at inducing hibernation in non-hibernating species. And so what they've done is they've looked at the ground squirrel and said, well, it can hibernate, it can reduce its metabolism by 99% and sleep through the winter. Um, what if we did that in non-hibernating species? And they were able to induce that in rats. Um, which was a big win, wow. but they've also had to um, deal with the side effects of gut ischemia, perforation, sepsis, and death. So there are a few things to sort out, um, but this yeah. is the value of looking at um, animal physiology of psychology, uh, sorry, of physiology of zoology, of comparative physiology, and um, seeing how they survive and seeing what which of those benefits that we can um, unlock for humans on exploration class missions and beyond. It seems mm -hmm. that from the from from uh, decades back with the Apollo missions till now, uh, we haven't had uh, a lot of evolution in in the sort of spacesuits that um, have existed and are used by astronauts. We we are we actually this is the golden age of um, creating new spacesuits. Um, once upon a time, you're very right. Um, there was a limited amount of uh, EVA spacesuits and contractors and providers. Um, and when you look back at footage from the Apollo missions, you can see that the astronauts were doing the best that they could with the what they had. So their center of gravity was quite high. It made them prone to falling over, um, especially on this deep, rocky, dusty lunar terrain, which wasn't easy to navigate, easy to navigate to begin with. Um, and then the um, their ability to bend at the waist was quite limited based on where their life support pack was. So they were really more using their knees to navigate. So it's actually quite exhausting. Um, and in addition, there was a lot of, of uh, pressure points. Um, and that was also a known issue with EVA suits during the shuttle uh, and even the ISS era, creating um, uh, subungual hemorrhages, so bruises under the fingernails, losing fingernails, creating pressure points on the shoulders. And so all of these lessons learned are critical towards evolving the next generation of spacesuits so we can get better fit, better mobility, better performance, and uh, better endurance for astronauts when they're out on these um, EVAs, which are already hours long, um, require lots of energy, lots of focus, lots of concentration. Um, and then also the survivability in these spacesuits. So the PLIS, the portable life support system, that little backpack um, on their backs does a lot of heavy lifting in terms of providing adequate oxygen oxygenation, temperature control, humidity control, and scrubbing, removing um, noxious um, uh, gases such as CO2 buildup from the spacesuit. Um, so being able to have a longer life um, is critical as we look towards doing more ambitious um, extravehicular activities on the moon and beyond. So um, what would be the top three engineering challenges from a medical uh, point of view to ensure that our astronauts are protected when they, let's say, work on a moon base or on Mars? Yeah, so I would say um, the top one and two are tied because they're a matter of survival. So it would be radiation protection um, as well as um, the strength of your portable life support system. Um, so those those are non-negotiable. You you really it's a place where you don't want to cut corners. Um, because the radiation um, exposure beyond uh, in deep space is, you know, is can be one of the showstoppers showstoppers if we don't adequately mitigate the exposure for astronauts. And then the last one would come down to comfort. Um, so what I mean is a suit that's ergonomic, that lets you move easily, that lets you, um, you know, uh, move your fingers, uh, move your hands in all, all um, axes, um, has adequate degrees of freedom. Um, because you're out there to perform work, you're there to explore the surface, maybe do some geological sampling, perform some science, um, maybe do some maintenance, um, and even some infrastructure building. So you need to be able to do that efficiently. So the ergonomics and comfort of the suit would be um, third in my view. 
You know, what we've seen in the past five years alone for evolution, you know, the fit of gloves, the fits of uh, suits, it's it's incredible. Um, and then, you know, I forgot to mention a fourth item on my wish list is uh, lunar dust repulsion. We know from the Apollo era that the lunar dust, the regolith is so fine and sticky. It got everywhere. It got in the suit joints. It clogged them up. So if they're able to, um, by virtue of their, even their, their polarity, repel lunar dust, um, which I believe has a negative charge, that's another bonus. Um, we're definitely getting there. Even SpaceX has entered the spacesuit game. They're familiar, of, uh, they're very um, famously had their IVA suits um, for their um, Crew Dragon um, missions, those um, very well-recognized white suits that are out there. And now with the upcoming Polaris Dawn um, civilian mission, um, they're pushing the boundaries because the commander of that mission, Jared Isaacman, has um, said that they're going to do the first civilian EVA or spacewalk. And so now Sp SpaceX has had to engineer a an EVA suit to be able to support that mission objective. Yeah, it just boggles the mind. Is there anything that space or any any part of, of the entire space ecosystem that SpaceX doesn't have a finger in the pie? <laughs> You know, they're very committed to be humanity being a multi-planetary um, yeah, species. species. Yes. So I think I think their activities definitely reflect that. Let's talk about since we talk about the future of uh, of, of of Homo sapiens and humans as a multi-planetary species. We need to reproduce in space. We need to have okay. babies in space. Yeah. Uh, we need to grow our population in space. Of course, not initially. But somewhere down the line, I would suspect, uh, when you have uh, more stable bases, maybe not on the moon, but on Mars, uh, which would be decades away. So how do we, can we reproduce in space? <laughs> Is it possible? I mean, That's some yeah, that's the million dollar question. And uh, the short answer is further studies are needed. Has anyone tried? Uh, the official party line is no. Um, there are rumors out there um, because uh, they're both on the Russian, on the Soviet side and on, on the um, US side. Uh, Mark Lee and Jan Davis famously or infamously were an astronaut couple that ended up going up on a uh, shuttle mission together um, because they didn't tell anyone they were married because it was against the rules for astronauts to fly together. Um, so they married in secret and then went on a shuttle mission together. Um, but the in, in interviews, once it was discovered, like they, they very firmly reiterate, they were on opposite ships. They were on opposite 12 hour shifts. So they never really saw each other um, over the, the mission. So to our knowledge, nothing has happened in space, but we know there's a plethora of zebrafish, jellyfish, a quail egg, rat, mice studies out there that at best say that the data is conflicting. Um, and so remember, when we talk about reproduction and we talk about intercourse in space, like it's a very um, multifaceted topic. It's everything from the psychology of interpersonal relations to um, the physicality of how bodily fluids accumulate in the zero G environment. Because remember, um, without one G, um, fluids can glob together. So that has implications for um, intercourse. Um, then we have to talk about gamete production and um, you know what sperm uh, motility is like in um, space. Um, we have to talk about uh, female um, fertility in space. And even there, the data is extraordinarily limited because only 12% of women to, to date have, uh, of astronauts to date have been women. Have been women um, yes. And most women opt for oral contraceptives for period suppression. Um, so we don't know what the menstrual cycle yeah. really does in yeah. space. Our data is very limited. Um, and then, so now we have to talk about, say we've overcome all those hurdles. What does yeah. em, uh, implantation and embryo um, development look like? What does- uh, yeah. um, How does the fetus develop? Exactly. And I, I guess these are, these, are, these are questions that I suppose would be answered when you get to it. Well, Kind of. Um, that's one approach to take. But, you know, myself and some of my research colleagues very firmly believe in doing this ethically uh, in a very um, cautious fashion because um, there's so much at stake here. Um, at the big picture, you know, humanity's longevity in the stars is at stake here. Um, yeah. And in the, in the short term, we're talking about an individual child's life, right? And, yeah. you know, say someone just took the leap and said, 
I not only want to conceive, but I also want to gestate off Earth. We don't have that data. What if the we have conflicting data that the neuromuscular development of rats is altered, but it's transient, so there may or may not be effects. But say we inflicted that on a child who had no say um, on their neurodevelopment, and say it had deleterious effects um, for um, height development, for bone uh, bone density development, for um, behavioral and neuro uh, neuro uh, development, all of that matters. And so that's why um, I'm such a proponent about doing this in a stepwise, nuanced and ethical fashion. And what would that be? Um, I think it involves advancing towards um, not just insect and um, uh, mammalian studies. So some mammalian studies have been done, but also um, the ethics for primate studies would be critical. Uh, there is a ban on that. Uh, I know in the early days of spaceflight, we did uh, experiment on chimps, and now rightly so for ethical reasons, uh, with, without, um, except in extenuating circumstances, it's just not done. Um, but I think this would be a very strong case in which we did look at primate research um, to be able to um, educate ourselves as to how reproduction and development occur off world. Is it, is it gonna take us decades? or perhaps centuries to go from Homo sapien to Homo galacticus? That's a really good question. And it's one that's really hard to answer because the nature of exponential change is that by the time we realize that change is coming, we're already about five steps behind. So when we talk about AI is the way of the future, we need to start thinking about ethical protections. When we start thinking about 3D printing, um, when we talk about um, the computing power and the processing power of, mic of, of chips, of computer chips, like we're already in that exponential um, change. And so when we talk about access to space, we already are at that inflection point. However, um, we also need to be mindful of the future that we want and how to create it. Um, and then also be mindful that some things aren't exponential. And by that, I mean generational change. So say that we did have um, successfully have a human couple gestate and um, give birth to the first off-world human and say they looked fine um, and maybe at the microscopic level there were minute but insignificant inconsequential changes in their DNA. Um, maybe it would be fine for the first generation but say as we had more off-world right. Uh, generations, maybe those changes are cumulative. And by the time that we reach, um, you know, generation four or five um, decades, centuries down the road, maybe that they're so divergent from humanity that it's essentially a sister species. So, you know, this is now we're getting to the realm of sci-fi. Um, but yeah. it's important to be mindful well, of the land of unintended. I mean, so much of so much of what what's around us today was sci-fi till very recently. Yeah. Yeah, even smartphones. Yeah, so. You look in, you look in um, science fiction, and they there's these concepts of having portable computers with us everywhere that you can answer any question on any whim, and essentially that's what our smartphones have become. So you know we are living in that sci-fi future. We just need to wield it responsibly. Is this purely a an evolutionary biology problem? Uh, you also spoken about AI. So could it be that? AI is involved uh, in some sort of symbiosis with AI and um, and robotics is where uh, our sister species would evolve to. It's um it's a biological challenge. It's an economic challenge. It's a political challenge. So um, I think uh, and not in that order. I think the humanity's fate in the stars um, for now rests in political will. It changes a little bit with the rise of commercial space, which is kind of promising. Um, and then coming back to the fundamental question of what does the future look like? Technology will be key um, because we're sending humans to one of the most austere environments that humanity has ever known. And so um, we need to ask ourselves, how do we not just survive, but thrive on that environment through technology when it comes to uh, communication, when it comes to operations, when it comes to decision making. And I think as machine learning and AI gets better uh, and more reliable and um, less um, error prone, uh, AI will be critical for monitoring, detection, 
uh, decision making, um, as well as uh, early warnings um, as to the health of our infrastructure, the health of our astronauts, um, the overall uh, probability of mission uh, success, um, and also offering useful interventions. So there is definitely, um, this it really is, the past year and past two years have been incredibly fruitful for AI with ChatGPT, um, with the rise of AI, with its applications for, for medicine, for for science, for engineering, um, for for the internet age. So um, to mm. be determined where we end up, but there's a lot of promise right now. So we've, we already have uh, had robots on, on the ISS. Uh, these are not AI enabled. Uh, we've had the Astro B. I'm, I'm just going to pull up a video of that. They're cute little cuboidal robots. Um, they've evolved very rapidly over the past few years. What happens when you add AI to these uh, to these robots? Um, do we need to evolve ourselves sufficiently, or can we outsource a lot of work uh, to to not only robots like Astro B, but also perhaps um, Tesla's Optimus robot? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I did my undergraduate work in neuroscience and focused my honors thesis on consciousness. And we're, we're kind of delving into the realm of philosophical right now, but one of the questions about mind and consciousness is that without sensors, without senses, you awaken in a room, but you have no sense of touch, smell, um sight taste or sound um without that like can you are you even really conscious um so when we talk about evolving the capabilities of um ais towards being a uh, true true intelligence a super intelligence it's the question is what types of senses are we enabling them with because even right now um I wouldn't trust an AI with something that entailed my life, so such as driving or piloting or medicine, um, because the context isn't there and the errors that AI has made um, have been scary. Um, so this is dated and probably doesn't apply anymore, but when IBM debuted Watson, initially for medicine and then finally on Jeopardy, yeah. uh, Watson famously lost by suggesting Toronto was the capital of Canada, uh, which of course it isn't. Um, and so then when we talk about enabling AI, um, taking away, stepping away from the technical term, like the technical discussion, I think it needs to be, well, AI, the technical part is we need to enable an AI with all of the same senses and more that a human might have um, to be able to fully comprehend and contextualize and understand its environment. Um, and then also understand that, you know, what are we, what are the pitfalls? What are the dangers and how do we protect against those? Um, and then we can start generating uh, and working towards AI in a truly productive fashion. And um, when we, when we contextualize and when we uh, enable AI with also a fail safe with recognizing critical errors and how to avoid those and how to um, recognize and decrease the rate of critical errors, then we can start talking about integrating AI um, and making it more independent, which of course is another philosophical question. Should AI be uh, independent of humans? Um, and what is the worst that can happen? We should certainly be asking ourselves that the whole way. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of directions in which AI can go, um, but we need to be asking ourselves hard questions the entire way. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, our Trion uh, brain has evolved from a lizard brain. Uh, because of uh, evolutionary reasons, um, and if if the AI brain is to evolve, or if um, we evolve together with AI and uh, implants, um, like what uh, again Elon Musk is trying to do, um, it just it raises a lot of ethical questions, as you rightly say. But also, it it's just the promise and potential that lies out there that it offers. This technology offers this. I, I don't know if transformational uh, is the right word, but what it does to our natural cadence of evolution as a species is it puts it on steroids. And there, there are questions not only of the ethical realm, but also the psychological questions of who we are as human beings um, when we are no longer just flesh and blood, but also technology. 
Absolutely, it does. And it's sort of, you know, it's really interesting because what exactly is a human? If you take take a human and just pile us up on a scale by virtue of our cells, we are more extraneous bacteria from our gut than we are human cells, right? So who are we really? What makes a human? Um, what is the gestalt where that the magic happens that we suddenly have minds and can talk and reflect and interact with one another. There's a lot of mysteries to be solved yet. And I think the future is promising when it comes to studying um, all of that. Yeah, and it's it's also surprising. Um, I, I pulled up the, the, the video from the ISS of uh, the heart cells earlier, and it all it took was a, a shot of electricity to get them beating. Um, so it's it begs the question, what is life and what is that life source? And there's so much to explore and discover, but then we're just going down a, <laughs> a different rabbit hole. And I'm afraid we'll go right down to the Warren if we continue. And we'll leave this for a different discussion when you have the time. So in Alien Anthology, the engineers are, are the creators uh, of the human race, as in the movie Prometheus. And a sacrificial engineer drinks the, the substance that causes his body to dissolve and it's his DNA that helps seed life uh, and kickstart uh, a faster pace of evolution of, of life um, on the planet. When we go to, to the moon, but perhaps more so Mars, as you rightly said, we're, uh, what, is, what is it to be human? And uh, uh, does it mean that we are a collection of our microbial gut organisms and the, the various fungi and and viruses that we carry along. When we go to Mars and live there on a base, are we the engineers of Mars? Are we the aliens introducing life to Mars as a planet? And what are the implications and repercussions of that? Yeah, certainly that's a very important question to be asking ourselves because planetary protections and the ethics around that um, are so critical. Even um, looking at uh, lunar exploration, how do we do that mindfully? Um, how do we protect heritage sites like the site of the Apollo 11 moon landing? So coming back to Mars, the stakes become even higher because we haven't ruled out the possibility of life on Mars. We know that there is uh, ice um, on both the moon and Mars. We know that um, it has snowed on Mars before. You know, this is something that we once thought it was a dead planet. And then we saw evidence of previous deep sea basins and geothermal vents. And we know that on Earth, life finds a way that we know that life um, exists around the most harsh and extreme environments on the bottom of the sea where the pressure and the temperature and the um, chemical composition is such that humans wouldn't even think about existing. Um, so now we have to realize that not just we mindful of being the aliens, but um, not creating harm. The first principle, as we talked about earlier this hour of medicine, is do you know harm? And I think it should be the same with exploration. Um, you know, we've seen what happens with irresponsible um, exploration, um, the way that smallpox was inflicted upon the indigenous peoples um, with early North American uh, colonial colonialization. And so we need to also be mindful that we shouldn't go as colonizers um, because that has um, had horrific effects and uh, consequences that have been generational um, in humanity's history. We should go as mindful settlers and we should have a plan to do so ethically based on the lessons learned in the past. So it's very, very critical that we think about not contaminating um, the environments we go to, especially where life may already exist um, and taking, pre um, and it also it'll affect the science that we do. Um, so it's really, um, critical to proceed mindfully and um, in a very um, considerate fashion. Let's talk about a bit about um, and stick with a bit of science uh, fiction. It, well, it does certainly look like science fiction, although there are uh, pretty detailed plans for terraforming Mars over a couple of centuries, perhaps. Do you think it's even possible? I think based on humanity's track record, nothing's impossible. Um, you know, we, we have humans on Antarctica, um, which was a century ago. It was an, this unknown land that nobody had been to. And now humans stay there year round. Um, so we have this propensity for um, transforming and terraforming. Um, 
well, not necessarily uh, terraforming, but we have a history of uh, transforming. Um, and I think it comes back to this um, idea of, at the end of the day, we want to be able to live, live uh, comfortably or at least not uncomfortably. Um, and it's just part of um, this, this human pattern that has emerged of making austere environments less austere. Um, so it may start with building, bringing a habitat with us that enables us to um, thrive on the surface of the moon, Mars and beyond. And it may um, progress with uh, building up connectivity so that we can connect with other habitats um, on foreign planets, on distant planets. Um, and then maybe we engineer these microcosms in which we are able to reach that that sort of freedom on a distant planet. Maybe it's under a dome with a very um, regulated closed loop life support system, but we can navigate freely without our spacesuits um, with a by injecting uh, our own atmosphere or our own life um, habitable um, life support um, within um, a closed dome. So it's hard to say where we'll end up, but I would say that given how committed we are as a species to take on hard problems, I wouldn't rule it out. Um, the future's still yet unwritten. Would you want to live there if it were possible? You know, I often get asked, would I go on a mission to Mars? Would I go on a one-way mission to Mars? And my answer is always, um, the devil's in the details. What am I going there for? Is it just for the sake of being the first or am I going for um, a an objective to that matters a lot to the survival of the species, to science, to exploration. That's more important to me. And then, you know, why is it a one-way mission? Is it because we haven't thought through the risks? We haven't mitigated the risks of radiation? We haven't trusted the technology? Well, that's not a very um, well thought out mission. Um, so is it a one-way mission because um, it's a very well engineered mission, all the risks have been mitigated, but the objectives are such that they call for that. I think that's a mission I could get behind. So it really depends on the philosophy and how the risks were thought about and how they were mitigated as well. I know you're very busy. I'll let you go. But I really appreciate you joining me for this episode. And I hope uh, you can take our time. Uh, there's so much to talk about, uh, just within your domain of expertise. And I wish you the very best. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for your thought provoking questions. I really had a great time um, discussing the future of space and humans in space.